Hello there, I'm Garth Forster, pastor of First Baptist Church in Barnesville, Georgia, and this course is Jason Till, our minister to students and young adults, doing a great job for us. We appreciate him so very, very much. And uh, just talking about yesterday's sermon, on Sunday morning I finished the second part of a two-part series on reopening the church right, uh, simply titled The Church Reopening Right. And this was part two. The first part dealt with the first four or five chapters of the book of Acts, we dealt with things like, let's reopen as an obedient church. The apostles were obedient to the Lord Jesus, and that's part of the reason that He blessed them in one, such wonderful ways as He did. Let's reopen as a praying church. One of the things that we see in the book of Acts is over and over and over again, whenever God is about to do something significant, He brings the church to its knees, and they pray, and God blesses them for that. We talked about, let's reopen as a Spirit-filled church. Uh, so important for us to be filled with God's Spirit uh, that there's no way that God can use us if we're not. And uh, the filling with the Spirit is said, simply said to have been, uh, Jason, the idea that we've got to empty ourselves of ourselves if we want God to fill us with Himself. And uh, that's got to happen. Then uh, we talked about let's reopening in the first sermon as a witnessing church. And finally, let's reopen in the first series we talked about as a generous church, as a giving church. And then yesterday, I, I took the second half of that idea of reopening right, and I concluded that with scriptures from Acts chapter 5 to about chapter 10. And as we did so, I, I started out with that illustration about the tombstone or the gravestone of Ruth Bell Graham. Uh, I was interested in, in reading an article that I did on that particular subject. Uh, it was a youth minister who was talking about, you know, I, I did this several years ago, and uh, he said, I was talking about Ruth Bell Graham and what a wonderful gravestone she had. And uh, I, I talked about she was the wife of Billy Graham. And he said that the, the youth just didn't get it at all. I mean, it absolutely made no impression on them whatsoever. And he said, finally, we went to lunch and one of the young men said, who was Billy Graham? <laughs> and uh, we have to understand we're talking to several generations here. And as we're talking to several generations, uh, some of the folks, some of the younger folks particularly, may not know the people that we're talking about in illustrations at all. They've never heard of them. Right. Uh, that was a great illustration from the fact that she had that, uh, she had that placard from road construction uh, engraved on her natural rock gravestone. And it said, end of construction, thanks for your patience. Uh, that's so meaningful to us as Christians. So very meaningful. Why would that be meaningful to you, Jason? <laughs> well, you know, uh, just look at, look at our daily life. We're such, we're such messes. I mean, there's uh, the fact that Scripture is true when it says that the flesh is weak. We, we all carry baggage. We, we carry mistakes. Um, uh, there's not a person breathing that's watching this that, that hasn't uh, walked outside of what right. God intended for their life at some point. That's right. um, you know, the the best we can do is to learn to walk patiently with people, to understand who we are in the sight of God. It helps us un relationally understand who other people are in the sight of God. You know, and, and so I, I love that headstone. Right. Thank you for being patient. Uh, we we have been under construction. You know, like the the potter's molding the clay. You know, right. We we are daily, hopefully, letting God shape us into who we're supposed to be. Even, even though that means sometimes he has to break things away or he has to, you know, firmly uh, move us in a direction. But, sure. but we are under construction, brother. I mean, I, I look at myself in the mirror every day and think, oh, my goodness, you know, why did you, why did you start this process, God? But, uh, but you're right. Um, the, the illustration rings true. And it's, it's funny, you know, the churches, if, if we would have the attitude that we're still under construction, that there's still things God might want to do through us, you know, yeah. that, that we haven't figured it out yet. Uh, we might have some things that work well, right. uh, but but truth is, you know, if we're not careful, we'll limit what God can do through us if we're sure. not looking for uh, ways to, to be His clay instead right. of trying to be uh, the masterpiece that we think we are. Yeah. You know, when you think about that idea, sometimes unbelievers are pretty hard on us mm -hmm. as the church. Uh, it's important, and we're not trying to get them to be easy on us, okay? We're not trying to use that as an excuse for saying right. that's, that's why we sin the way we sin. What we're trying to say is none of us are perfect. That's right. All of us are under construction. All of us are a work in progress. And that being the case, you know, we need to be patient with one another and ask others to be patient with us uh, because right. we are works in progress. It, it's, we began yesterday's sermon with the concept, let's reopen as a pure church. 
And he used the story of Ananias and Sapphira. And of course, this is the, the first negative thing that happens in the book of Acts is that Ananias and Sapphira have lied to the apostles and Peter says that they've lied to the Holy Spirit about money. Now, Billy Graham, y'all remember who Billy Graham was? Billy Graham, uh, he, you know, he said that three things get preachers. Sex, pride, and money. That's right. And uh, money got Ananias and Sapphira. They, uh, they were the kinds of folks who sold their property for a lot more money than they actually brought to the apostles, but they lied and told the apostles this was the selling price. And boy, God was not in much of a mood to put up with any nonsense that day because Ananias and Sapphira both dropped dead because they lied to the Holy Spirit. It tells us how seriously God takes sin. So yeah, we're under construction, but that doesn't mean we can take sin non-seriously. That's right. Uh, God wants us to understand He takes purity as a very important commodity in His people, that we need to be pure. And uh, none of us is perfect, but all of us ought to be making progress toward perfection and becoming purer each and every day. Uh, we've all seen folks mess up in ministry. We've all seen people mess up outside of ministry. Uh, and that's, you know, it's something that can happen to us as humans. And it will happen to us if we're not very careful and make sure that we stay close to the Lord and that we're growing in our faith in Him. I've never seen a growing Christian who made a mistake that could not come back from it. But when people are running from God and they make a big boo-boo in their lives, a big, particularly moral mistake, it's much harder for them to come back from that. You can call it shame, you can call it guilt, you can call it whatever you want to call it, but it's much harder for them to come back from that. The early church was able to come back from that difficulty, uh, and that's, that's why we're here, is because the early church was successful. Uh, secondly, I talked about the early church being a ministering church, so let's reopen as a ministering church, and that's such an important idea because it is the ministries that the church performs that gives the church life and gives the church the opportunity to reach new people. And I know you've done a lot of that, Jason. We definitely try. There you go. <laughs> you know, uh, what what is uh, what is relationship with the Lord if we're not if we're not partnering with Him in the process? You know, I, I think about a a call to to serve. Uh, you know, it it all stems from a desire to please. You know, to to honor God uh, with with our life and our efforts and, and our resources. Uh, it's it's a way for us to to essentially worship. Right. And uh, I really believe personally that when we serve, we grow. And I, I think I think that that is demonstrated. And you know, anybody that would say, "Well, I went on a mission trip when I was 17 years old," and, and I still remember that, well, yeah. it's because that service gave you something physical to hang on to that that helped you grow a little closer to the Lord. That's right. That's why I think uh, I think being missional is so important. Uh, whether it's uh, cooking lunch for somebody like we've seen happen recently or uh, people bringing donuts you know, mm -hmm. by the church. What a blessing. Uh, and, and those little things just push people ever so closer to hope and to uh, faith and, and hopefully to know Christ. Yeah, and, and service too. You know, this is, a, this is an appropriate word at an appropriate time. If you're struggling with this COVID-19 problem, if you feel like you've forgotten or lacked, uh, somehow lost your purpose in life, if you feel like you're all alone in life, uh, one of the things that you can do that will get rid of those feelings and help you feel a part of God's plan again is to find a place to serve. That's right. Find a place, some, some, find somebody to serve. Uh, don't care who you are, there's somebody out there worse off than you are. And if you'll make that person your mission, and serve that individual, you'll find several things will happen. Number one, you'll recreate for yourself a sense of God's purpose for your life. Right. Number two, you'll stop feeling so lonely because all of a sudden you've become important in the life of somebody else, another person. And that is one of the ways that, that I find that people who, and I'm not saying you do, but I'm saying I find that people with a problem with selfishness, when they become selfless, in their service to other people, then they suddenly for the first time become happy and for the first time find a sense of purpose in life. And uh, that's what ministry is all about.
That's right. You know, growing churches find ways to do ministry. They find ways to help people. And because they do that, they attract people to themselves. And, you know, lots of folks are hurting out there, especially right now. There are all kinds of things we can do to bless them and to encourage them. We need to try to find those things to do. That's right. Brother, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to channel my inner Greg Burrell right now. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking about uh, uh, Bob Dylan wrote a song years and years ago uh, entitled Serve Somebody. Okay. And that was the, the essence of it. you got to serve somebody. You're either going to serve uh, self or you're going to serve the Lord. Yeah. And uh, there's, there's some... There's some power in just finding somebody to serve and, and in that brings glory to God. And I think you said it in your sermon uh, Sunday, but, but I think there's some value to it that, you know, churches, they, they only are as strong as the ministries that, that the people of the church are, are involved in right. and leading. And so we all have a place yeah. uh, to serve. No matter what age, what, what, what background, we, we all have this place. We just got to be willing to find it. Yeah. And uh, as I tell our students all the time, put our yes on the table. There you uh, go. We may not know what that is going to involve, but but hey, God, you know the yes is there. Just show me what it is, and you know next thing you know, you're. Uh, uh, I think your illustration was uh, teaching people how to potty train. <laughs> you know, <laughs> who knows what God will lead you to, but but it all starts with that yes being it on does. the table. It's find a need, meet a need. Now you got a ministry. That's you right. Know, that's how it works. That's so, right. And it's it's so very important that we do that. Uh, the comment that, that Jason was referring to is the one uh, that's one of those principles about church growth, and that is the church can only grow lo as large as the ministries that its people, its lay people, are willing to uh, fulfill in the life of that church. And it has to happen that way uh, if God is going to continue to bless the church. We talk about the church reopening as a courageous church. And of course, that was the Stephen role. Stephen was one of the first deacons. He was probably the high sung deacon. He is, they mention his name in Acts chapter 6, and unlike anybody else, pretty much, everybody else just gets a name placed there. Stephen gets a little explanation. He's called a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. So, you know, we, we know, of course, he's a, a strong Christian man. He's going to be one of the first deacons, but he also becomes the first martyr of the Christian church. Uh, he dies because he refuses to be silenced in his witness for Jesus Christ. And his courage is just unbelievable when you think about how outnumbered he was in that setting. You know, when, when you read about the story of Stephen in Acts chapter 7 and just the very, the very first portion of Acts chapter 8, you don't read that there were any other believers there with him. You get the feeling like he was all by himself. You know, that Saul was there. Uh, he's going to eventually become Paul. And Saul is, is on the side of the Jewish religious leaders who want to shut up Stephen. And, but Stephen's pretty much by himself here. And we see a courage that is tremendously inspiring. And we've, we've, all, we've all known people of courage. It's, courage is one of those funny things. It's, it's one of those things you don't know that you've got until you need it. And then when you need it, you find out whether or not you've got it, okay? Uh, doesn't mean you can't build it. Uh, but again, you want to be careful talking about what a courageous person you are in non-courageous times because you'll probably shame yourself down the road somewhere. Sure. The, the bottom line becomes courage is something that God gives us. Jesus told his disciples, don't worry about what you're going to say when persecution comes. I'll be speaking through you. I'll be with you. The main thing you don't want to do is crumple when persecution comes. You want to stay courageous instead during that time. We talked about, of course, let's reopen not only as a courageous church, but let's reopen as a missions-minded church. The idea that we need to have a heart for missions. And I know, Jason, you have such a heart within you, and it, it shows all through your ministry that you desire to serve others and to bless others, not only here at home, but as far as the Lord will take you. Uh, we're, we've got a little mission trip planned for Cali, Wyoming, our good friend, Johannes Slabert and his wife Mary Beth are inv have invited us out to do a vacation Bible school in the middle of July. And we're looking forward to being able to go on that trip. Uh, I always love being with them. He's a man with a great heart. Uh, she's a pastor's daughter. Uh, he uh, was uh, he came over from South Africa uh, to North Carolina. Really didn't know what he was going to do. Was good with horses and uh, got saved. Came to know Christ through the ministry of Samaritan's Purse met his wife, Mary Beth, and 
they realized that the Lord was calling them to the mission field. And the mission field that God was calling them to was to Wyoming, the state of Wyoming, because he is a horseman by trade and folks respect that out there. Right. They don't necessarily respect preachers a whole lot, but they respect horsemen a whole lot. Uh, so he has a natural calling. He was telling me the other day, Jason, that he, uh, he normally had about, oh, 50 or 60 look-ins when he did his live stream service. Well, he's been preaching from horseback. Right. He's been having 500 look-ins. Yeah, I saw that service. the other day, brother. I was yeah. wondering if, you, if Ms. Suzanne had, had yeah. shown you that on Facebook. <laughs> yeah. so. Absolutely. We're proud of him. He's doing a great job there. And, uh, but he's a mission's heart. Uh, he realized from the very beginning, God saves us, when you really think about it, God saves us so that while we're here on this earth, we might lead others to Christ. Um, if, if God did not intend for us to do that, he would probably take us home the moment we got saved. But he leaves us here for a mission. And that mission is to see that other people come to know Christ. And then of course, we ended by talking about an unstoppable church that uh, the, though the Jewish authorities tried everything in their power to stop the early church, and it seems like it shouldn't have been all that hard in the beginning, but these are people that are different than they used to be. Uh, this isn't Peter running through the night away from the cross. Mm -hmm. This is not the other disciples who were, had gone into hiding. You know, we, we typically blame Peter because he denied Jesus. Where were the other disciples? You know, they were hiding somewhere. Uh, they were just as afraid. But this little church that on the night that Jesus was arrested, the next day he was crucified, that was running away, suddenly becomes an unstoppable church, suddenly becomes a church that says, we don't care what you do to us. We will not stop proclaiming the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's right. And that's what all of our churches need to do. Uh, it's, it's one of those things that means the gospel needs to be our ultimate priority in life sharing the gospel with others. Uh, we all need to make a recommitment to that idea. That's right. That the gospel would be our number one love, our number one goal, our number one passion in life. Anything else, brother? Brother, that's good. You know, I, I, I think about, you know, the sermon series was the church reopening, right? And I know there's a lot of, a lot of questions, a lot of thoughts. All of a sudden, there's a lot of people that know what churches ought to do and uh, you know, the, the one thing that really uh, hit home in your sermon, and I, I hope that it'll continue to encourage me because I, more than anybody, I'm ready to be back around students and young adults and, and just be engaged in the energy there. But uh, you said something about Stephen that I think is so important for us to remember as a church. Uh, we should be courageous and, and we, we should be ready to open back up and get to rolling and worshiping. But, but in that setting, Stephen... Stephen was courageous because of the witness for Christ in that setting. Uh, I think it's important for us to continue to walk in, in courage, but not in foolishness, yeah. right? And to uh, make sure that, that we are doing things we need to do that, that God is pleased with, not what we want to happen. And so I think what you shared a minute ago and what you shared with staff just this morning, uh, it, we should wake up with a heartbeat to share the gospel with somebody. If we're doing that, we're doing church right. Yeah. whether we're worshiping on Sunday mornings right. or not. And so I think for me, the personal challenge is I've, I've got to be willing uh, to continue to engage people with hope and truth by sharing what Jesus did on the cross and uh, the life that we have because of him. And so I appreciate the encouragement and the challenge this week. It was a great message. Well, brother, I appreciate you. Absolutely. It was an encouragement to all of us. Thank you so very much for joining us today. May God bless you. May he help you live your life right the way Jesus wants you to. God bless.